Hey everyone, thanks for stopping by Peace Garage. Now, I'm going to call a time out for a second. Based on the last video, I want to take a few minutes and talk about torque. Because there were a lot of questions about torquing and the fasteners I was using, the, the ARP fasteners. And the questions I got most often were, are the threads lubed? Did I lube the threads? And the other one was, did I lube underneath the head of the fastener? Those are some big questions. Now, this is a pretty important thing when you're torquing down cylinder heads, no matter what you're torquing down. Whether you're using a regular fastener, torque to yield fastener, whatever. Now, I've done a few videos about fastening, about how lube affects the torque of the clamp load after angle. I've talked about stress strain diagrams. But I just want to talk right now, uh, real quick, and help you understand a little, little bit about what happens when you put lubrication on threads and underneath the head of a bolt. We're going to talk a little about what affects uh, the uh, torque. We're going, to talk, we're going to do an experiment. I've got a couple experiments planned so we can I can show you how that lubrication affects a thread, affects a bolt, affects the torque, the clamping, all that stuff. So let's talk real quick about the things that affect torque. So now we're going to focus on things that affect torque. And torque, quite simply, is resistance to rotation. You take a fastener, you screw it into something, that resistance to the rotation, and how much you have to twist it to put it in is the torque. Okay? Uh, we're going to have fights over what is torque and what isn't torque, but basically, we know what torque is. Okay? Well, that's not the purpose of this video. The purpose of this video is to talk about the things that affect it and what happens when you put lubricant under the head of a fastener. Now, the base material. Are you putting a fastener into cast iron? Are you putting it into aluminum? Are you putting it into steel, brass, copper? Whatever. The base material is going to affect the torque because the base material is going to have a different yield strength based on what it's made out of, obviously. The fastener material. Is the fastener a stainless steel fastener? Is it a steel fastener? Is it uh, a, a, a titanium fastener going into cast iron? It all makes a big difference and it all affects torque. How the torque is going to be calculated. The thread pitch and area of engagement. Obviously, if you have a coarse thread, it's not going to have as much thread engagement when you screw it in. It's not going to be touching as much area as if you have a fine thread. So the thread pitch and area of engagement, or the total thread area of engagement, is going to have a big effect on torque. Now, the whole surface finish, the thread inside the hole, the surface finish of those threads. If you were to take a uh, micrometer or, or a, a microscope and you were able to look at the threads, the surface finish of the threads inside a hole, you would see that the, the, the surface finish is going to vary. So from hole to hole, you could take the same bolt and put it different holes and think you have it torqued down to the same torque every time. It's going to be different based on surface finish. You have to account for tool wear. Was this uh, part made and did you use one tap to tap 32 holes? Well, if you did that, the 32nd hole is going to have a different surface finish than the first hole because you have tool wear. The speed and feed, how fast was the thread cut? Uh, was there coolant involved? Uh, did it speed up to account for tool wear? And is it, what, did you use a single or a multi-tool? Meaning, did you have a single tool tapping 32 holes? Or did you have 32 taps tapping all the holes at the same time? That affects the torque. Now, fastener th thread surface finish. When you have a fastener, like a bolt, you have to know, you don't have to know, but if it's forged, if it's die cut, if it's single point cut on a lathe, if it's made on a screw machine, all of those different types of manufacturing methods will have a different surface finish on the thread. And the coarser or the rougher the surface finish, the more it's going to affect the torque, as you can imagine. Now, coatings and lubricants. When you say none, we say, okay, I have a bolt, and I'm not going to put any lubricant on there, and I'm not going to, so I just use regular torque. Well, if it's zinc plated, zinc is considered a lubricant. So if you have a zinc plated bolt, it's not unplated, it's not unlubricated, it's lubricated with zinc. Zinc changes torque just like black oxide. The ARP fasteners I was using, they're black coated, so that coating affects torque. Loctite. If you put Loctite in a hole and you torque a fastener down, that's a lubricant. Obviously, oils, assembly lubes, especially the fastener lube ARP, that ARP assembly lube, we're going to talk about that because they designed it to do a specific thing, and I'm going to show you what that is meant to do. Now, here's the effect of lubricants, and here's just an example. You can look this up online. You can find this anywhere. Here's just an example. Let's take this half-inch 13 bolt here. If I have no lube on the bolt, you can get torque will be 121 foot-pounds. If I put a graphite lube, that torque decreases by 49 to 55 percent, giving me a foot-pounds of 62. White grease, 79. 
SAE 30 oil, 79, 40 oil, 83. So you can see based on the lubricity of what I put on the threads, I'm going to have a decrease in torque, which meaning I don't have to torque it as much to reach the same clamping load. So when you see a, a, a torque that's, let's say, no, you call no lube 121, and all of a sudden I, I put a, a, some graphite lube on there, I only need 62 pounds on there to achieve the, sa achieve the same clamp load because the lubricant changes the threshold of torque. Now here is right off ARP's website. These are the recommended torques used to achieve optimum preload or the clamping force using the ARP Ultra Torque Fastening Lubricant, okay? And I'm going to focus on the 7 16 bolt because that's what the, the uh, head bolts are. And I torque those to 70 foot-pounds right there, the preload being 11,880. That's what we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on that size right there. Obviously, if you have a higher tensile strength material, meaning a harder uh, harder material and have those have a higher tensile strength you can put a higher heavier preload because you can put more torque on it what we're trying to do here in this step what these numbers are calculated on is something very basic it's based on the applied torque now we go back here you see where it says here recommended torque to achieve optimum preload clamping force preload what is preload now applied torque the stress strain diagram that I've used in other videos and what we have here is as you're running a fastener in, it's, it's, it's seeing some stress, you're stressing the, the fastener, you're, you're stretching out the, the bolt, you're taking it in there and you're stretching it out. And as you get the point A, which is the elastic limit, as long as you stay under this limit, you can put that bolt in and out as many times as you want and torque it down. You're never going to hurt the fastener, you're never going to hurt the threads in the hole. That is our elastic limit right there. That is sub, usually 75% of the total limit of the elastic limit of the uh, yield, I'm sorry, the total yield of the fastener. So that 75% is really important. B is our yield stress point that when you have a torque to yield fastener, when you, when you get to A, you put a torque on here and you start to put your angle on there, you're trying to stretch the fastener, stretch it to its tensile, tensile break point, and you're trying to yield it. When you yield it, that means it's stretched permanently. It'll never go back to its original condition. That is why you have to throw away torque to yield fasteners. Okay? Now, the 75%, the, the torque that I put on there of 70 foot-pounds is 75% of the tensile strength of that fastener. That's what I put on that fastener, okay? When you put an angle on, now, when you put an angle on, you completely forget about what you did in this step. You torque it. Forget it. That's all done. Now you're putting an angle on. Now I'm going to take a fastener and I'm going to turn it 90 degrees, right? I'm applying an angle. When I apply an angle, I'm adding an additional clamp force. I am not applying more torque. The clamp force is a calculation. It's a very complex calculation that we're not going to go through here. But I just want to let you know that when you apply an angle to a fastener, torque to yield, this is what you're doing right here when you put an angle on a fastener. You're yielding the threads, and once it's stretched, you've got to throw it away. That's why it's always best to buy a new fastener. If it's a torque to yield fastener, always replace it, okay? Now, the angle calculated, it's a calculated rotation of a fastener to reach the yield point. We want to reach the yield point this right here. We want to get as close to that yield point as possible. We don't want to go past it because if you go past it, that's when it's starting to break. But you want to get as close to that yield point as you can with a fastener so that you're uh, uh, maintaining, getting to and maintaining the optimum clamp load for a fastener. That angle right there, we want to stop just before we get to the yield point of the bolt or the fastener. That's when we talk about torque to yield fasteners. A torque to yield fastener, first you apply the torque. Then you apply an angle to get the maximum clamp load right to the yield point. Once it gets there, you stop, and that's as tight as it will ever go. That's as much clamping load as you can ever apply. And once you take it out, the bolt is permanently stretched, and you have to throw it away. Now, why use the ARP Ultra Torque Lube? That's the lube. That's right here. This is the lube right here. The Ultra Torque Lube. This is what comes with the ARP fasteners. And they... Uh, make this, they have spent years developing this to do something very specific. And this is what they designed it to do. You put the torque on there and what they do is they have this design so that when you get the 70 foot-pounds or the 75% of ten tensile strength of the material, you're sure that on the first try you're going to get right to the maximum torque. This is also is a chart that's taken right off of the website from ARP and it's this is just a generic installation preload scatter comparison and what it's showing is this if I take a fastener and if I put the ARP ultra torque lube on there an EPL, a molly lube or just regular oil it's showing on my first try I will get right up to my maximum uh, torque 
on the first try. And, and if you take the bolt out, put it back in, out, in, out, in, out, in, you'll get an even torque or even clamp load all the way across with, the, with this ARP fastener loop. If you use oil, it's going to start low, and as you take it in and put, put, uh, take it out and put it back in and torque it down, you're going to squish the oil out, the oil is going to be worn away, and you'll eventually get up here right around the eighth try. Same thing with the Molly or EPL. So this, the lube that comes with the fasteners is designed for you to put it on the fastener and get it to the preload immediately on the first try. And for parts where you might take apart all the time, maybe like heads or intake manifold, whatever you might have to take apart a lot, this is to make sure that when you take it out and put it back in, you get right to where you were before. You don't want to have this kind of curve in here. You start it out loose, you tighten it up, and then you take it out, put it back in, and all of a sudden your, your part is coming loose. But the important thing here is preload. We're trying to put a preload on the part. It's a clamping load, okay? Preload, clamp load. Now here's the calculation for a bolt, uh, bolt preload calculation. We're not going to go through it because it's really, really complex. But what I'm trying to say here is that the bolt pretension, also called the bolt preload or pre-stress, comes from the installed torque when you apply it when you install the bolt. That's all this is. That's what the formula is, and, but the important thing that I'm going to stress here and we're going to talk about a little later is a, a torque coefficient. This K, this K coefficient, the torque coefficient is part of the coefficient of friction of the material. When you have different kinds of materials, they have different coefficients of friction. So putting a, a lubrication on a fastener against a different material with a different uh, coefficient of friction, it's going to be different. And it's a really complex formula to figure out this torque coefficient. So you can do out this, this formula right here to figure out what your optimum preload is. But I'm just showing you that, it, that it's a science. This torquing these things are a science. And t guessing yourself is very, very I'm going to say difficult, but I'm not going to say wrong, but it's very difficult to do because the manufacturers know how they want their fasteners torqued down, which is why I always say follow the manufacturer's recommendations, okay? Now, we're going to do a test. I have those cylinder heads torqued down. And what we're going to do is we're going to measure the dry breakaway torque. Those cylinder heads are torqued down. I took clean the bolts and there's no lube on the threads. I'm sorry, no lube underneath the head. I put lube on the threads, but there's no lube underneath the heads. So what we're going to do is we're going to mark the position of the bolt. We're going to, I'm going to measure the breakaway torque. I'll make a chart of what the breakaway torque looks like for every one of the fasteners. Breakaway torque is just how much, how much force it takes, how much torque it takes to take a fastener, break the coefficient of friction, the friction, to break it loose, Breaking, called breakaway, so you're breaking it. You know, we can say I'm gonna break a bolt, but I'm gonna break it loose. That's what you're doing. You're breaking the coefficient of friction and you're loosening it. So I'm gonna measure the breakaway torque for all the fasteners and I'm gonna make a map and we're gonna see what it looks like. We're gonna see how even it's been torqued with no lubrication underneath the head of the fastener. Okay, here's our experiment. First thing I did was, which might be hard to see, I put a clock mark on every one of these bolts. There's 17 bolts. I put a clock mark at 12 o'clock on every one of the fasteners because I want to know after I loosen these up and put lubrication underneath the head of the bolt, where is it going to end up with identical torque of 70 foot-pounds. But first I'm going to measure the breakaway torque. I'm going to use this device right here. This is just a, 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 it's a, it can be used as a torque wrench. I use it to calibrate torque wrenches. And you can uh, buy this at Harbor Freight. It's like 28, 30 bucks. It's totally worth it. Works really well. And what I'm basically doing is I'm going to put this on every one of the bolts. And I'm going to measure the torque. And you can see if I take this and twist this, it stops at, your, at a torque. So I'm going to be able to measure the breakaway torque on all 17 of these fasteners. Let me do that, and then we'll look at a map when I'm done. Now I have every one of these loose. You can see they were at 12 o'clock. Now the line's cracked open. I have all those values recorded. I'm going to take all these fasteners and I'm going to put lubrication underneath the head of the fastener. Right where it's supposed to be, underneath the head. And I'm going to retorque these down and we're going to find out where these end up in the clock position. We're going to see how close to 12 o'clock we're going to end up with those after I retorque them back down. Now all the bolts are retorqued. And as you can see they went from 12 o'clock to a little bit between 12 and 1. Did not go very far. Some of them went to 1, but uh, I'm looking at all of them and they're all about the same. Just about 12.30 where the hand would be. So it's like halfway between 12 and 1. Which means putting lubricant 
the ARP lubricant under the head of the bolt does not result in a huge change in where the bolt rests when you go to 70 foot-pounds of torque. So, everyone who asks, did I put lubricant under the thread or under the head of the bolt? It doesn't make a huge difference. The difference is on the thread. I put it on the thread, that's where it's consistent. Now, what is interesting is what the breakaway torques were. I made a chart, let's take a quick look at that chart. So here are the results. The blue line, the blue bar going up, is the breakaway torque with no lube under the head. The blue line is the average. So that's where about the average fell for the breakaway with no lubrication under the head of the fastener. The green line, that this fluorescent green, is the breakaway torque after I put lube underneath the head. And the red line is the average breakaway after I put lube underneath the head. What this tells us is, if you put lube underneath the head of a fastener, it's going to turn just slightly more when you torque it, and when you go to loosen it or take it out, it's going to lower the breakaway torque a little bit on average, but if you notice what it did, it not only lowered the average, but at these peaks that are in here, those peaks aren't in there anymore, so it made the torque or the breakaway torque on all the fasteners a little more uniform. So by putting the lubrication underneath the head of the bolt, you are uh, allowing yourself or allowing the set of bolts to be torqued more evenly. So that is why you put the lube under the head of the bolt. It's not going to change the torque. It's not going to change much with the fastener. It just makes the torque more even over a series of fasteners. And I just showed you uh, how that's possible and what the data showed. Now, the uh, next most common question I had, did you test the heads? Did you, can you take the heads right out of the box, put them on the engine, and expect them to run? Did you test them for leaks? Did you test them? The answer is no, I didn't. People have said, there were comments like, um, um, I've, I, many times I've had problems with cylinder heads. Or I've taken them out of box and it's happened to me several times. And I've learned over my um, tenure working in the automotive industry and in in building engines, is that those, those are pretty subjective terms. If you build one engine and you have a bad cylinder head, then 100% of the heads you put on are bad. If you build 100 engines, and you get one set of bad heads, then 1% is bad. So it's all relative. Can it happen? Absolutely. Every manufacturer is prone to have quality issues, errors, things are going to happen. Now, I was a process engineer for, for General Motors for a long time. I worked in an engine plant, and I was responsible for cylinder head machining and engine assembly. I worked on the L29 454-502 the L29 line for Chevy and made I was a process engineer for cylinder head machining made hundreds of thousands of cylinder heads were they all perfect? no they weren't perfect but you know what they all passed a leak test and the leak test is designed around variation that occurs in manufacturing in the machining process when you make anything I don't care if you're making hot dogs, if you're making cylinder heads, or you're building airplanes. There's going to be variation from part to part. The difference is how well the company has quality control under control, what they do to monitor quality. Now, 20 years ago when we were building the L29, yeah, the tolerances were a little loose. I worked on new engine lines, and I'll tell you right now, like you buy a brand new Malibu with the LGE in it, the four-cylinder turbo, that engine's got tight tolerances, and they are built with very little variation, and they are very good engines. So, did I test the head? No. I never test the heads, because I rely on the manufacturer to give me a good product. I've never had a bad cylinder head where it was so bad the engine wouldn't run, uh, so I can't say whether or not you can or can't do it or shouldn't do it, but if you could test it, you wouldn't be able to afford the equipment you would need to properly test the cylinder head anyway. So that answer about testing it, should you not test it, really not applicable because you can't test it. There really is no test. There are things you can do, but starting it up and running is really the best way to do it. Now, the next one. 
Piston to valve clearance. People are asking me, did I check piston to valve clearance? The answer again is no. The reason is because when I choose the parts for the engine, when I choose the pistons, the heads, the gaskets, the connecting rods, all that stuff, I know that what I'm buying will match. If I was going to put together a real radical engine with a flat top piston and, and some kind of, or a dome piston with some real radical cam and had huge lift and giant valves or something like that, then I would check piston and valve clearance because then you might have some interference. You want to see how close it is. But what I'm doing here with, with stock heads made by an incredible company, the pistons matched perfectly, excellent parts. I really don't have any reason to need to check it. Maybe when I build a video or do a video in the future when I'm building an engine, I have to do that. I'll do that, okay? So let's talk about this in conclusion. This whole discussion about should I lube the threads? Should I lube under the head? Did you lube the what? It, the, this, is the, this is what I recommend. I, I'm going to say it again. Follow what the manufacturer recommends. Now, I did one cylinder head for this demonstration, but I also did the other one to make sure that they're both exactly the same. So whatever you do to one, make sure you do to the other so that they're both identical. That's, a, that's a very important because you want an even stress on the cylinder head. You want it all to be stressed evenly so you torque in a pattern. And on both sides you want to do it similar so that they're stressed evenly. Okay, that's number one. So when you put lubrication on a thread, just know what you're doing. Um, it's the days of uh, the experience where uh, I used to build engines back in the 70s or 60s and 70s, and we always put oil on our cylinder head bolts, or we always soaked our lifters in oil. All of those reasons that people did that stuff years ago, the reasons for it really no longer exist. What they were doing is they were they were trying to account for or make up for variations in manufacturing processes, okay? That's what they were trying to do. So now, tolerances and machining capabilities are incredible. You can hold tolerances on crankshaft, polishing journals and microns, under 10 microns, which is extremely tight, okay? Some engines are using zero weight oil because you only have room for two or three molecules of oil between the bearing and the crankshaft. Those are very, very tight tolerances. And when you're manufacturing something to those tight tolerances, you don't have to do all those old school tricks. Soaking things in oil, doing this, adding grease, putting... You don't have to do that anymore. Modern technology, modern manufacturing techniques make these products incredible. TripFlow, a reputable company, great products, can be pistons, eagle rods, eagle cranks. You choose quality components which means you don't buy some name brand, uh, uh, off-brand name, something that's made in China that you can't realize or, or, or uh, rely on the material or the source information. You can't take it. If you're going to go cheap, you're going to end up with something cheap. But if you go with a reputable company, one that has a good web presence and a good reputation, you, you can't fail. So follow what the manufacturer recommends. I always say you can call their technical support and ask them for help. You're choosing parts. You can call any, any one of the big uh, mail order places and say, hey, I'm trying to choose pistons and heads, can you help me? I'm trying to choose some heads. I want to choose a manifold to match my heads. I want, I want to match a cart. People are going to help you, but you have to take the initiative. You have to pick up the phone, call them up and say, this is what I'm trying to do. Could you please help? It's that simple. I'm just trying to help you with some of the basic techniques so that when you're assembling an engine, you have a greater chance of success, okay? That's all I'm trying to do. I'm not telling you how to build a 440 in this series. What I'm trying to show you is that when you're building a 440 and you get to this part, here are some ways you can ensure that you're not going to have any leaks. Or here's an upgrade. That kind of thing. I'm going to share those little tricks with you. But as far as building the engine as a general, in a general sense, if you follow these general techniques, cleanliness, when I did the oil pump video, and I took apart the oil pump, and people thought, you know, Pete's crazy, he's got OCD, he's taking apart a brand new oil pump. Well, you know, you take it apart, and it was dirty on the inside. And someone left a nasty comment saying that it was just uh, dust and it was nothing to worry about. Well, it only took me roughly, uh, if you're just going to do that, it would take you 15 minutes to do it. I, like, I powder coated, so it took like 45. But the point is this. I've been doing this for 30 years, okay? I have never had an engine fail and taken it apart and say, you know what, this engine failed because it was too clean. Never happens. I've had it fail. Now, now listen to this. This is how, how tight tolerance this is. 
I had a guy, the engine was seized up. Took it apart, one bearing was burnt, burnt up, right? And I had it analyzed. I had the bearing analyzed to find out what was on that bearing that made that one bearing burn. Came back, you know what it was? Chocolate, chocolate. The guy who was installing the bearings on the assembly line was eating a chocolate bar. He had some chocolate on his thumb, he pushed the bearing down, and he left a thumbprint of chocolate on a bearing. The top, it left enough there that when the crank was put and it was all assembled, it turned, the chocolate heated up, the sugar and the chocolate turned into carbon real quick, and it seized up the bearing and spun the bearing from chocolate. So when, when you people think that I'm paranoid, I say be careful with FM and, and make sure you don't use paper towels. Incidentally, in that uh, oil pump video, I only used paper towels to clean out the inside. When I went to assemble it, there wasn't a paper towel in sight. I use lint-free rags when assembly. But if I'm going to take something apart, just clean it off before I wash it, yeah, I'm going to use paper towels. They're cheap. But as long as I'm going to wash it out, dry it out, blow it off, and wipe it down with lint-free cloth after, then I don't have to worry about anything being in there. But like I said, you're never going to go wrong by being too clean. Uh, I, I work as clean as possible, and I'm trying to encourage you to work as clean as possible. It doesn't take that much effort. So, I hope this helped you out a little bit, understanding a little more about why you put lubricant under the, the head and on the threads of a fastener. Particularly with these head bolts, with these ARP fasteners, what is their lubricant intended to do for you? Why do you use it? Why do you use that instead of oil? What should you use? Now that was a steel bolt going into a cast iron block. If that was a steel bolt going to aluminum, it'd be a little different. Remember we were talking about the charts and the base material and the fastener and all those materials affecting torque? Well, that's huge. So, that's why I went through this video, to try and help you understand a little more about that. And I felt the need to call time out a little bit during while I'm building this engine because people were asking questions that were great questions. And I don't want to leave those questions unanswered, and some of them were pretty common. So I think when I made that cylinder head video, installing those cylinder heads, I don't think I did a good job telling everyone how to, how to do it, what I was doing. It seems like I did put too much stuff in their advertisements of how, how great the cylinder heads was. And I'm not advertising for trick flow, I was just trying to show that they were great cylinder heads. But now I'm trying to go back a little bit and say, all right, this is why it's important to put the lube on the heads. That's all I can say. I appreciate you taking time to watch this video. I know it's long. I know there's a lot of stuff, but I just wanted to clear up those issues. And if you have any questions or comments, please leave them. We can talk about it again. I want to continue on with this engine and get on a dyno because it's going to be a monster. I'm going to be putting in the valve train next. So I appreciate you watching my video. Thanks for stopping by Pete's Garage.